find any of them looping. Welcome to Against Discovery. Um, <laughs> no, with what? Alan, Michael, Terrence, Jeff, and Darcy. Uh, uh, let's. Just, um, I think we were kind of already talking about why this subject resonated with you, uh, why you wanted to be on this panel, and I was wondering if everyone could discuss that briefly, um, starting with Jeff. <laughs> well, I, I started i got involved in the science fiction when i got bored with westerns i got bored with westerns when i was about 12, 12 years old and figured out, out hey all these stories are the same good guy kills bad guy gets girl you know and I, that was from the 12 year old perspective of course and i wanted to see you know look and explore and discover things and you know one of the problems you find in some of these stories there's an awful lot of them in, in science fiction that just are kind of, you know, somebody gets in a spaceship and discovers something and uh, conquers the world or doesn't conquer the world or, um, and I think sometimes, I, so I got bored, I, I found, the first thing I remember that really set, uh, that, uh, set something different to me was a story by Clifford Simak in uh, this, uh, book for I think it was written in the 50s uh, called Honorable Opponent and you know it starts out like the earth has been defeated by these aliens and are co we're coming they're coming to sur uh, to accept our surrender or something like that and it turns out they were just playing a game it's like video game players they were playing a game and and they become honorable opponents. We want to play a game with you again. We we want to tell you how to do it. And that was fresh. And I like fresh. And you know, I try to do that myself. I've tried to do that myself. So, you know, that that was how I got, you know, in a sense how how I got started on this and why that appealed to me so much. Oh, uh, what about you, Terrence? Well, you know, it's funny. I'm going to be weirdly out of sync because I couldn't get my camera going. So you'll hear my voice. I'll be looking like a badly dubbed Italian movie. Um, I remember growing up watching black and white TV and Johnny Weissmuller and all these Tarzan movies. And as I grew up, they just kept making them because I remember watching Avatar. And I loved Avatar right up to the point that it was like, oh, I get it the white guy is going to go live with the blue people and that thing they've been living with for generations that they can't fly i'll bet you he's going to master that by the end of the movie and save the day and sure enough and then i look at there was a whole other liberal uh slant version of these non genre filmmaking which were like films like biko where you had these movies about characters white characters in south africa were horrified horrified to discover that their country was racist because their black friend was being oppressed. And all these movies had one thing in common, which is that the filmmakers felt they couldn't address the issue without putting someone that they felt the audience would identify with. I think that sells the audience short. I think the audiences are able to identify with characters much different from them because most characters are much different from us. And I think that it, it's, it's a stagnant trope I think that it did start very much, I was going to say, it comes out of the old days of Victorian imperialism, where we sailed, with, oh, we, where they sailed around the world, you know, meeting new people and conquering them. The assumption was always that whoever you met, that you were discovering, uh, was primitive, was lesser than you because you had the technology to get to them. And it didn't occur to them that maybe they didn't want to go to you and found nothing of value there. So I, I think that we need to look at things differently. I, I was thinking about examples of something that goes completely against that. And I was thinking of James Tiptree's The Sparrow, which I read about 10 years ago. And it's a novel about Earth contact with aliens. Priests go to try to be missionaries. They have no clue as to what the culture is that they're in. And it, it goes horribly. This poor priest ends up being a sex slave for 10 years. He comes back to Earth. But it was a wonderful example 
of looking at an outsider culture, looking at a culture as an outsider and understanding that you, you will never master that, that you don't even understand how it works. And that's one of many directions you could go in as opposed to, you know, John Carter rallying together the sick forearm Martians to beat the bad guy. Absolutely. Um, uh, Michael, what about you? I, I have a hard time answering this question. I feel like I've been um, moving forward. For, I was, I've liked science fiction since I was in middle school, I guess. And, and I read the, the kind of older style science fiction we're talking about for a while. And at some point, I started to get woke and I've been starting to get woke the whole rest of my 41 years of my life. And I can't figure out where I recognized how uh, caught up in it all the, the colonialist mindset is. Uh, so it's, it's hard for me to unravel all that. Uh, but since Terrence was just talking about the sparrow, I mean, I, I have this in, I have reference to this in my copious notes. Yeah, it's not James Tiptree, it's Mary Doria Russell, I believe. Uh, but anyway, that, that's, um, I made lists of stories that uphold this trope the way it was originally seen in science fiction as I perceive it, and then some that sort of like uh, question it, but maybe don't get all the way. And that's, uh, the, the sparrow is on that list uh, because uh, the, I believe he's a Jesuit priest who's uh, exploring the alien world. Um, and, but it falls into that thing where eventually the aliens end up seeming very horrific. Uh, there are some horrible, sexual violence towards the end of that book that uh, I did not enjoy at all, despite enjoying that book thoroughly. Um, but I feel like it does that thing where you make the aliens alien and the shock value and the, the delivery of the ending is based on uh, alienating us, the readers who are expected to be white folks. Uh, so, some somewhere along the line, I, this started to seem incredibly problematic to me, and now I can't help seeing it everywhere. Uh, <laughs> I, I saw Avatar in a movie theater in Guatemala, dubbed into Spanish, surrounded by Guatemalans who are all ninety-seven percent of them are indigenous, and the word indigenous is over and over in that movie. And every time I heard it, I'm cringing <laughs> like I'm the white guy in this theater. Uh, so I'll stop there. There's too much. <laughs> I, I will just jump in to say that you're quite right about the author. I looked back and went, where did I get James Tiptree? It won the James Tiptree Award. My eyes skipped by the author's name and went too far. So quite right about the author's name, but very much in lines with what you're saying. Okay. Yeah, uh, and Alan, uh, what about you? Well, I have a different perspective because I did not grow up reading science fiction. So um, my first foray into reading science fiction was um, about the year 2001, 2002. I was planning to go on a vacation where I was going to be on my in-laws house. And I figured I needed a book. And the New York Times had this um, article on how something different had happened in science fiction in the 80s, which they were talking about cyberpunk. And that sent me on a uh, to the used bookstore looking for William Gibson. So I started where science fiction to me was thinking about a capitalist hellscape in which there are multiple stories going on at once, all of people trying to survive rather than any sort of dominant hero trying to uh, go and conquer because nobody is conquering. The, uh, um, the protagonist and all, and well, one of the protagonists in all tomorrow's parties may actually be um, completely insane or they may be uh, in on a conspiracy, we don't know. And that to me was actually kind of an exciting way to look at it because it actually was modeling the reality. At the time, I'm a PhD biochemist. I uh, was collaborating a lot with engineers and the idea to draw, to draw uh, um, connections between disparate data types, that's exactly what I was doing. I was just amazed that this guy Gibson could essentially write my, write my career here. And when I ended up moving out of the science world, I um, started uh, thinking, you know, maybe I could write some of this stuff. 
So I, my last days in the science were in more of an environmental science uh, end of things where uh, you see it was at the point where it was absolutely patently clear to everyone that this, except the politicians, that the climate catastrophe was impending and upon us. Now I think even the politicians are starting to get it. And there are no protagonists anymore. I mean, it's not just that you have somebody trying to conquer something and other people, you have these structures, which essentially are the antagonist and all of us are a collective protagonist. And to me, that tells me that you can't have um, the adventure novel where somebody sails in, solves all the problems, science saves the day, whatever, what have you. It's just not realistic, it's not happening. To me, I never had the bias of this model. Yeah, and I, I briefly, so I'm the moderator and I, I like to leave the discussion for panelists when I moderate, but I do want to say that one reason I, I was interested in this panel topic was because of my science background. Uh, I, I both have a PhD in oceanography, geosciences, but I also work with my tribe as an indigenous scientist, um, largely focusing on how we're how crops, you know, the, the type of stuff that that we grow in Texas, that we used to grow traditionally and endemic stuff. And just being a scientist in both worlds, I, I came to see how often discovery in, in terms of um, knowledge that people were uncovering through the scientific method, how often uh, groups actually knew about that potentially for millennia. And just like these Western scientists were coming in saying, ah, oh, yes, we discovered this. And it's, it's really a question of who counts as the human who is learning something for the first time and, and looking at science fiction fantasy, um, that is a very interesting question. And I, I was interested to discuss uh, the ways that discovery as a concept could be expanded, uh, could be uh, moved away from that Victorian standard because in many ways discovery can be empowering. There's like self-discovery there's the discovery of stepping into a magical world. And you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, going to an alien planet full of blue people who are like basically just like space natives. <laughs> like that, it doesn't have to be that. So uh, the next question is how would you recommend moving away or expanding upon that you know, original Victorian adventure model in, into different types of fiction, different types of stories about discovery. Um, you know, are there any works of fiction? Uh, for example, Michael, you, you mentioned that you made lists that, that you think did, did that well, even if it's your own fiction that you want to talk about. Um, and if someone wants to jump in or I can call on people, it's so hard with Zoom. <laughs> well, I, I can jump into this because I, uh... Was when I was one of the other things that I was thinking about with this was I, I wrote a story in a, that came out in Extreme Planets, and the genesis of it was uh, I write about science, and one of the things that fascinated me was the idea that planets could be drifting between star systems. In fact, we've discovered since I wrote this that you know there are chunks of rock and things that come between solar systems. So I in this world, I had envisioned uh, humans from Earth are sending probes out into the Kuiper belt to see what's out there. And they come upon this planet like ice an ice ball planet, kind of like Europa or something, one of the great icy moons. And they send out a probe to it. And then I switch back and forth to the creatures that are living in this Sub, uh, hmm. sub uh, ice covered ocean on a planet that is being warmed by internal volcanism. And they have their own culture. They're, of course, you know, entirely uh, submarine. And they, what they don't, they've been between stars for so long that they've only started noticing that there's a little bit of warmth coming in. So we hmm. have. And I switch back and forth, and each side is learning about the uh, that there's something else out there. And I call it daybreak. Sort of the, that that came from mm -hmm. the the Asimov Nightfall story. Uh, just thinking of daybreak, where you discover something, where you you see something, and there's no conflict. They don't even have any interaction with it, other than seeing the probe come in and what's this, and then the 
the uh, creatures in the planet ice ball break the cord off and because they're catching it themselves themselves what is this we're going to explore this so i didn't write it with this theme in mind but that's what i was trying to do was do something different uh, that sounds really it's, it's like a mutual exchange of, of yeah. discovering each other and and no one side changes or takes over the other side yeah, i like that one of the things that Alan said, I think that pinpoints it for me, which which I hadn't thought of it in those terms before. But the reason that it really doesn't work is that it's it's no longer where we're at. I mean, that's not the world we live in, and it's it's it doesn't. At best, fiction exposes us uh, our, us to a part of ourselves we didn't see in that way, and this is a trope that doesn't do that anymore because that's not the world we live in. Lord knows, it's a lot of people would like to be back in that world. But I, I, the starting point to me is very funny because the starting point is just to flip the, the coin, you know, so like, um, uh, sorry for calling was like the, the black man is at the bottom suddenly climbing his way to the top of a hideous system that no one should be a part of. But that even said something more about it. I remember years ago, Robert Downey Seniors was a filmmaker before Robert Downey Jr. was born and became Iron Man. He made some amazing films, but one of the films he made that was very key was a movie called Putney Swope, which people should look up because it was essentially about a white advertising agency with one black guy in it. And the time comes to decide who's gonna run it and none of them wanna vote for each other. So all of them vote for the black guy just because they figure no one else will. And he gets a unanimous vote and he takes over the company and he transforms everything. The film's in black and white, but the ads they do are in color. There's an interracial couple running in slow-mo to kiss under a tree for gum or something. But it's it's a brilliant reversal of that concept of, you know, well, we know what we're doing and you don't. It's somebody who's been a part of it, but sees it very differently, taking it over and, and rebuilding it completely. And that's the beginning, I think, of playing with this is, the initial just straight reversal of it, but then to just start seeing where that takes us and play with it more. I think the one point in which a single heroic protagonist can still be viable is a very small, intimate, close story. So I have um, one story I sold to an anthology a couple of years ago um, where it purports to be about quantum communication, but what it really is about is it's a couple in a marriage with a child where they're drifting apart and essentially they are the heroes of their story that they um, come to understand each other. So it's that sort of small story you can still have in the science fictional context as sort of background, you can still have a uh, hero if it's a character driven, very small story. But I don't think it's realistic as a big story because no single individual is responsible for a whole lot in this world. Though, what's very funny is I saw a trailer for the new Dune movie, which looks great. I mean, visually, everything, but I'm watching it and I'm thinking about this panel and I'm like, oh, right. And someone told me that the people on Arrakis were brown, that they were people of color, which never was reflected in anything. So I was like, oh, well, here we are again. Young, skinny, white Paul <laughs> comes to Arrakis and becomes the savior. He He's the one who can communicate in a way no man has. He's a, so we're, we're still playing it because we're playing off of old stories that played off of that. We need better source material for movies. You know, that's funny because I only read Dune recently, not having grown up um, reading um, science fiction. I jumped into some of the classics recently and I had looked at him as the white guy uh, interloping in an indigenous uh, population. So that you never read it that way to begin with. Was it because you saw the movies that didn't show it that way? I never read it. I, I wasn't I wasn't like a, a, a needy teenager who wanted to rule the world. So I didn't it didn't appeal to me. But um, and I and truthfully, I didn't think of it with the other two film versions. It, it came up in context of this conversation of going and I suspect there'll be things I'll be looking at for the next month going. Eh, it's another one ah, because it but it's there. And the fact that you could read the book and see it means it's really there in the material that it starts from. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I remember it as 
I got very tired of it because it all went to this one central hero who was doing everything or you know, was somehow the center of it all. And it just, you know, it, it, the first, it was originally published as, I think, two serials in analog. And the first one kind of held up. And the second one, it just got, it got boring. Maybe I was just a kid and, you know, I got bored easily. But, you know, I, I've also written about the history of science. And one of the things that there has certainly taught me is that there's no, no one person makes a great invention. You know, I've gone into a lot of how the laser was made. And it's true that the man who made the first laser was pretty much doing it himself, but he's still standing on the, the shoulders of other people who had uh, provoked, developed some of the ideas. He had an assistant who was, actually he had been in the Japanese internment camps. He was a, you know, a Jap of Japanese ancestry and he was you know, a student uh, working under him. So, you know, there's lots of different textures, even in something that's basically set in the history of the 1960s. I think yeah. part of the reason for that is the mythos of capitalism. Like how many of us really, uh, how many, I would bet even just looking at the people listening to this panel, how many people realize that the quote unquote Moderna vaccine, all of the basic science, virtually all of the development uh, was done at a lab at NIH and they just contracted out to Moderna for a little bit of it. So, but the capitalist company come to our rescue is a narrative we've come to expect. Yeah. I was kind of just and listening to this conversation. Uh, I'm now interested, if anyone knows, if there's a book out there where the main character has this grandiose belief that he or she or like this chosen <laughs> one is the state of the world. And like, in fact, it's just very realistically not true. And just, I would love to read that take. I think that might be fun. Um, I haven't come across it, but I feel like there has to be a book like that out there somewhere. Uh, Don Quixote. Uh, yeah, like, uh, like a sci-fi fantasy Don Quixote, I guess. <laughs> well, if not, someone really does need to write it. I mean, just, just because I love the concept of this character who's so narrow in their vision, they're so sure they're right, and everyone around them is like, look, really, it's okay, you can go home now. We, we don't need any of this right now. <laughs> That's pretty well, funny. I love some fun. satirical Voltaire takes Candide. on that. Mm -hmm. Voltaire's Candide. It's the best of all possible worlds. I mean, when it becomes the best of all <laughs> possible disembowelings and things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm, this is not new. I'm, I'm coming up with ancient examples from hundreds of years ago. Yeah. Voltaire is still funny. Yes. He wrote the truth. He wrote the truth. God. Oh, what were uh, you going to say? I don't know. I've, I've seen contemporary satirical takes on uh, that, that like, hmm, I can't remember who the author is, but uh, you know, wh where the main character is a Voldemort Sauron type who uh, is terrible at it. And but the thing about that is that uh, it's, it's sort of like once you've caught the joke, for me anyway, it, it mm -hmm. ran out of steam, you know. Um, but you're right, there's been, uh, resistance to this trope for a long time. I mean, I, I was thinking about uh, The Lost World by Arthur Conan Doyle was a thing that came to me as the, the thing that most fits the beginning mm -hmm. of this panel description. Uh, Professor Challenger goes and uh, kills some natives, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, but in that same era, you've got the War of the Worlds uh, where the colonizers are Mars and, and we survive uh, based on a fluke. Uh, and, and I think that has produced a whole thread of science fiction. Uh, the, the trouble with it is for the purposes of this panel, I think is that uh, I think it manages to affirm the Campbellian hero uh, in most cases. I mean, War of the Worlds doesn't. In War of the Worlds, they try and they try and they fail and then uh, deus ex machina are saved, but uh, uh, Starship Troopers is another thing I thought of, and the, the whole all the all the science fiction in that vein, where the evil aliens are trying to colonize us, and by God, we're going to blast them out of the skies. You know that that's not really helping. Um, 
so then but there are like in in the recent past uh Arcady martin's a memory called empire is a really good uh uh, space opera in which the main character is from a colonized culture and uh, gains the memories of one of the colonizers and goes to the capital city um, and um, messes them all up in it to, and with a great deal of effort, you know. But uh, that's a that's a beautiful book which I recommend. Uh, and then, okay, so here's another one since. No one else is interrupting me. Uh, how about um, Sophia Samatar's uh, uh, A Stranger in Alondria and the sequel is called The Winged Histories. Uh, those are both, uh, A Stranger in Alondria more so. We start with someone who is of a colonized culture, who's been educated into the colonizing culture, uh, is aware of a resistance in the world and is made much more aware of it and sort of embarrassed at their own complicity as the story progresses and and we see the colonizing culture fall. Uh, so this is the you know uh, um, what's his name Versing Getterix, uh, the fall of Rome. You know uh, the, there are occasions on which in which the colonized have defeated the colonizers after a, mm -hmm. a great deal of loss of culture and all this and there's one model that we could look to for ways to tell this story from the other side on the darkest <laughs> point about the, um the parodies of all this i'm saying what just occurred to me the old philip k dick novel called the simulacrum where the president dies but the people behind him sort of need him to exist so they make a, a simulacrum of him and they pretend that he still exists so that might be along the lines of what you were asking about, about a sort of a parody of all the uh, the hero that's, uh, that is all-knowing. Well, you know, I, one of the things I was thinking of just a moment ago was, uh, ironically, uh, Ender's Game. There's been a lot of discussion about the author. We won't go there. But it's an interesting novel to the degree that it begins very much in this trope of our children are so smart, they can defeat these aliens and they will wipe them out to the point that the kid actually does. He, he succeeds. He figures out how he wipes out the planet. But the ending reverses all of that because he realizes that he wiped out a superior culture. They weren't the aggressors. He was wrong to do this. And then I haven't read the later books, but then goes off to try to basically redeem the, 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 their destruction by helping them to come back. To, to, to breed them, to save their culture and, and propagate it. And that's another approach. The, the concept of somebody who goes into a culture, messes everything up or, or misconstrues it completely and then understands it and, and embraces it in a different way. Uh, one of the sequels to Ender's Game is on my list of tried but didn't quite get there. Uh, Speaker for the Dead yeah. and Ender makes friends that's with these adorable little weird uh, roly-poly aliens and then <laughs> he turns out to be horribly disgusted by their death rituals and uh, it, it sort of has a, a, it resonates in the same way that the sparrow did for me anyway uh, mm -hmm. it's it seemed like he didn't go far enough which who is surprised when it's always this card card okay I sometimes but that's interesting that things are you know like that are an editor stepping in and say, well, nobody's going to read this. Nobody's going to buy this if it, you know, we don't have a hero. Well, yeah. that's more than one editor or producer has ruined more than one story. Um, and that's, that's certainly not an impossibility for a lot of things, you know, sadly. It's, it's, it's still a marketplace and that changes sometimes how things get done. Um, I liked what Alan said earlier about the way to tell a story with a single protagonist now is to have it be very individual, have it be about people. Uh, this is something I brainstormed yeah. when I first read this panel topic, uh, that personal discovery is still a thing. And even yeah. though there are, you know, two yeah. uncontacted tribes left, and let's hope that no Cortezes appear to ruin them, uh, you know, every day I meet a new person, and that's an experience of discovery because their lives are completely different from mine. Um, yeah, I, that's actually, I was going to ask a question kind of related to personal discovery or other forms of discovery that 
you they have great potential to be science fiction fantasy type stories that that you like to read or that you like to write um and i, I think that's actually personal discovery is something that that i i like these, these more intimate stories where it's not saying you're discovering something on behalf of all humankind but more you're discovering something on behalf of yourself uh, i was wondering uh what everyone else thought on that well you know it, it it's so funny because that should be the essence of all these stories but it, it isn't generally by the end the character has only been reaffirmed in his own assumptions about his own abilities i mean john carter's not a different guy by the end of it when he gets princess thora he's still the guy who is fighting the civil war or whatever i don't know how much development there's been in these characters and that's i mean tarzan never even learns to speak english he changes so little across the movies but i i that's all of that that's actually a thing that some of those stories that we're talking about are lacking they're lacking the personal discovery and i think that's that's it that's the key that needs to be put back into those stories to make them at all relevant and to scale them down make it about the internal it's it's not about cultures it's about perceptions i think one of the things that you can do in this single character i write a lot of short shorts and that's a wonderful medium for sketching out a character mm. Mm. Uh, and discovering something uh it's a, a very small it's a very small picture but it lets you focus you know, tightly and sometimes I, I i can't remember one that i've done exactly like that but sometimes because sometimes there's you know, a joke at the end uh but this is you know it it is a different kind of story than trying to write a novel i, I mean I, I think of you know another example of a different type was uh hal clement's mission of gravity where the store what the story is is that uh, earthmen have come to have lost something on this uh jupiter size jupiter-like planet uh, that's very large and has a very high gravitational field and they have to go down an earthling has to go down and get it but they have to have help from the mescalins because if they're the, they, they can barely survive in the crap gravity mm -hmm. So, you know, they're working together to meet a common goal. As a, it's a, been a long time since I've read it. But, you know, Hal Clement was a rather gentle writer. He didn't make a lot of, you know, shoot and bang, you know, people out with ray guns blowing everybody else up. Mm -hmm. uh, travel narratives um, are, it's like a class of story that strikes me as being the the Voyage of Personal Discovery. One of my favorite books in the world is mm -hmm. Jan Morris's mm -hmm. uh, Last Letters from Hav. Uh, Jan sure. Morris is a, a travel writer who has written many books about, uh, was, um, I believe he died a few years ago, uh, but career of traveling to, you know, Azerbaijan and writing a book about it. And then here's this fictional city, uh, city state. And uh, I feel that the character is profoundly changed there. Um, and it's just, why I love it is that it's just like awe-inspiring small weirdness piled on awe-inspiring <laughs> small weirdness. Mm -hmm. uh, it has the patina <laughs> of reality surrounding it because she is a, a nonfiction travel writer. And I don't know quite how that works, how that confers on this fictional city so much believability but it really works on me and uh and the city uh experiences a revolution and she barely makes it out alive and and we're left with this vast like what just happened uh what has this done to me and that's sort of how i walk away from that book uh and having traveled some you know i have the i've had the experience of culture shock i don't know if you all have uh it's wonderful after you get over being terrified you know uh and i yeah i'd love to see more of that in science fiction encountering a culture with humility utter humility mm -hmm. and being absorbed into it well you know even just 
openness. I mean, when you think about it, the main characters are entree into this world. I was just thinking of Dahlgren, where a character goes to a city. It's completely alien to any of his experience. He doesn't try to take it over. He he basically is transformed by it. He he conforms to its conventions. He learns how it works. And by the end, he's leaving in a new state as somebody who can then pass on the, the I can't remember what they call the, the weapons, the orchid. He passes the orchid that was he used to defend himself in the city onto the next person walking in. And there's this implication that this is, this is a continuing process, that we always have new people coming to any society, that we always get, see ourselves differently based on who's coming in and looking at us. It, there's, a, there's a feedback loop there that you feel in New York all the time as a, as a resident, as people go walking through, perceiving you differently than you perceive yourself. But that's, that's ultimately the best thing of these things, where the character goes in with a sense of discovery and is changed by what they find for the better or for the worse, but they're not imposing their own values on what they're seeing. They're understanding what's actually there. Yeah, um, is there anything else? If not, we have a couple of questions and looks like we have about, oh, until 9.25. So we have some time to answer them. Um, Yay. Oh, cool. Perfect. All right, so uh, the first question. Perfect timing. I'd love to know the panelists' thoughts about how these intersect with different genres, fantasy so much more often having the one trope. Uh, so I, I guess mm -hmm. how, how this discovery concept uh, manifests in science fiction, fantasy genres. Um, and anyone can feel free <laughs> to uh, answer these. Uh, well, here's here's a not science fiction genre story that I thought about. Um, Lovecraft. Uh, what's the one with the dream city? It's right up there on my shelf. If I can remember what it's called. Oh. Um... Anyway, he wrote this short novel where it's just a guy falls asleep and has experiences this super weird dream world, and it is the the least racist thing i can recall him having written i could be wrong i ran out of steam on lovecraft a long time ago but it made me think about um about lovecraft and the way that uh the zeitgeist is is uh inverting lovecraft right now um sending up his racism and uh wondering about something like uh the Shadow Over Innsmouth, which is about being colonized by eldritch evil aliens uh, and being transformed into them. Oh, terrifying, you know. Um, they hate it when it happens. Right. So is, is there a potential here for a parallel uh, horror uh, rejuvenation of the tropes of Lovecraft uh, from an indigenous perspective, uh, where, where you make the white people into the eldritch aliens who are trying to eat your culture and society and you resist them somehow or you go insane. Maybe this already exists. Uh, it seems a little different from uh, stuff like Lovecraft Country uh, because the, the black experience has already got the colonization and the um, removal from your culture baked into it. But I'm kind of, so I'm, uh, there's, a uh, horror anthology was just announced and I'm, I'm part of it but i'm actually more excited to see what everyone else is going to write and it's just like all indigenous horror it's called never whistle at night mm. or so, i think that's a title, <laughs> very close to the title um so I, i'm actually curious to see if any of the writers are going to d take on that kind of cosmic horror lovecraftian vein and maybe reimagine it uh but yeah well, I, i'm not sure that's the the angle i'm going with my story but <laughs> it would be interesting I do find it very funny. I, I keep hearing this of, of his body spinning in his grave because there are so many writers <laughs> of color who are adapting his work that are, are doing well. I mean, from the, uh, the Red Hook story that um, I'm blocking his name right now, Black Tom, you know, which I think started the ball rolling. Lovecraft Country, dealing with a black family and, and melding Lovecraftian horror into the horror of racism. Um, 
but but I keep looking at these things. Nora Jemison's The City We Became. I I don't want to give anything away, but I was on the floor laughing my ass off with horror. It was scary, but at the same time, it's like I can't believe this is where she's taken it. And it, it was brilliant. It was wonderful. And there's just all of these things being done. So that I think is an example of how you, you take traditional material and you you rebirth it. You give it a fresh face. You you put it into the context of today, not in the uh, cancellation way of oh we don't talk about those things, but in a transformative way. I mean, I I love I my third vampire novel is is Lovecraftian. And it, it it I couldn't help myself. It was the only thing I hadn't done in the other two books. And I love his work. He's a problematic favorite. Uh, I don't think I'd want to have dinner with him. But I don't know what my work would be without what he created. So there's there's wonderful ways of taking these things. I mean, you can rewrite Avatar and make it work. You can, you can <laughs> rewrite Tarzan and make it work. All these things can be just reconstructed in a different way, and it transforms them completely. All right. If, if no one else, we just actually got a bunch of questions. So maybe we can try to answer as many of these as possible. And uh, there will always be like the green room at other places to talk, if not. Um, all right, next question. How do you make the savior have a different hero's journey and have it be satisfying? Uh, they put savior in quotes. Hmm. I, I guess uh, for me, I, I would really think about who, the, who this person is saving. Like, are they going out and saving a indigenous right. culture or, or elves, you know, who are standing for the indigenous <laughs> culture? Or are they, they may be saving their own family, uh, just something that doesn't play into this kind of old old belief that the the enlightened, you know, superior hero is going to come in and just share his greatness with this almost inferior group of people. Like I, I would just not not do that and focus more on on trying to make this this savior uh, save. There's something intimate, honestly, as we discussed earlier, that that's often satisfying, or or maybe just a group within his own culture. I don't know. <laughs> what do y'all think? I think maybe we can draw from reality. Mm -hmm. Coming from this perspective, at this point in my life, I'm teaching high school and I'm teaching environmental science, and I found that uh -huh. um, when you look at some of the things that are in what the state expects you to teach about, uh, say, uh, the tragedy of the commons, where uh, unless uh, a property is all privately owned, you couldn't possibly uh, conserve it. I've started to incorporate some of the Native American perspectives there and, and brought some readings in and have the kids criticize what's in the textbook based on, say, Russell Means. So this is happening. Look at the Code Access Pipeline uh, protest. When you look at uh, a lot of these uh, protests, uh, there are people coming from different perspectives where they are being the brave ones. They're being, um, they at one point were being hosed down in minus 20 degree weather with these uh, horrible hoses that looked like it was bull counter in the uh, civil rights movement, except at minus 20 degrees. So I think coming from a perspective in the real world where you have to start understanding all of these other cultures to understand how we can essentially uh, uh, do something about the climate catastrophe can also be done in fiction, where a lot of different narratives are valuable and a lot of different narratives are what are necessary for any sort of heroic over um, uh, heroic overstory, but not with a single protagonist. I think one of the things that would is would be nice to do is to show show a group of people each coming in from a different approach each coming in from a different culture and background and each contributing mm. something vital to building the whole thing i think I, just putting savior in quotes puts the, the the rest of the concept i mean the the main thing is that they shouldn't be walking in thinking they're the savior of anything they they can be a part of it but why or why is that individual being tasked with that job i mean that's not an easy job and that's why it's in quotes. It's it's absurd as a concept, unless you're actually divine and actually saving the world. And that's technically only maybe happened once. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I've just been thinking about, I live in Michigan, uh, and the, the person who comes to mind when I hear this question 
is uh, Mary Copany, AKA Little Miss Flint. She was 12 when the Flint crisis happened and she's, uh, she's 16 or so now. And she <laughs> seems heroic to me. Uh, she, she's putting herself out there constantly. She's raising money uh, for kids who've all had lead poisoning to get the stuff they need to go to school and learn and make up for that, you know, as best she can. Uh, but the way that she's an individual hero is the media perceives her that way and she perceives that they perceive her and says, I'm going to do something good with this. Um, and well, and she, she's not a white man, you know, she's she's not a white savior, she's saving her community. Greta uh, Thunberg would be another good example of that. And she's uh, taken on um, politicians worldwide based on starting from just not going to school and going on strike until we did something about the climate crisis. So I think that's an excellent idea that you could have very non-traditional saviors who are only a savior because the media makes them one, but then they run with it and get someone. Yeah. 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 Malala is another one. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's the person who isn't saving by personal individual effort, but by pointing out that there is a problem to be solved mm -hmm. and involving others in it. That's that's really the only way you can save anybody these days. By collective effort and making sure people understand it. Yeah, uh, very good points. Uh, the next question is panelists have mentioned some older colonization stories doing ETC. And there was some discussion of the data nature of those approaches. I'm wondering if the panelists have considered the feminist science fiction from the same time. How are writers like Tiptree, <laughs> Russ, Le Guin addressing the problem of discovery or colonization? Well, I can jump in with Kathy Acker. I think Empire of the Senseless did it brilliantly by incorporating postmodernism. So I guess loosely that if there's any plot to the story at all, it's about a revolution in Algeria and two people in love during it. But you get the whole gestalt of this oppressive system from taking it from all sorts of different cut up perspectives like um, Bur William S. Burroughs on steroids. And I think that's a wonderful book. And, uh, <laughs> that's a terrifying concept. Can you say the title William again? Burroughs on steroids. Uh, Kathy Acker's Empire of the Senseless. OK, thank you. Hmm. She was more 1990s, but um, uh, it's. I think that's kind of the tail end of what the person was referring to. Um, hmm. I would say that in terms of feminist uh, science fiction, uh, one of my favorite stories um, is by Marge Piercy of that in that era. It's um, uh, oh uh, oh, why am I blanking on that? I'll I'll, I'll Google the title in a second, but uh, it's basically. A lot of different cultures are, are represented. And then there is uh, this kind of evil proto cyberpunk world that may or may not be a dream, but these cultures are um, all collaborating to be part of the solution. Or uh, Starhawks, the fifth sacred thing, would be another one, a uh, feminist approach where a lot of uh, cultures are drawn from, and you have this. Uh, essentially idealistic utopian community as a contrast to the uh, dystopic community in LA. So woman on, woman on the edge of time, that was the Marge Piercy story, I, no, no, what I was thinking of. I think it's a brilliant book from the 1960s. Uh, I, I don't really have a complete answer for Le Guin, but um, Twitter has, has shown me some discussion about the world building of Earthsea being subversively radical in its attempts to take apart what Tolkien was doing. Uh, hmm. She doesn't tell us that all the siren. Um, <laughs> she doesn't I'm tell sorry. us that all the PC races, all the main character races are, are people of color. And uh, sh there is this, um, the, the mages of that world have created this empty space uh, from which they draw their magic. And it's this place of like uh, absence and dryness and undeath, and it's very artificial. Uh, and so I, I don't have the theory to give you for where she was getting all that or what she was trying to do with it. But uh, maybe if you go on Twitter and search Earthsea, you might get a better sense of it than I can give you. Yeah. Uh, if no one else, I, I think we have four minutes left and I, I have to remember to do the closing 
summary. So maybe one more question. You got till 20, 25 after. We have 14 minutes left. Wait, my clock is so wrong. Oh my gosh, sorry. I was going to say that was a fast 25 minutes. Okay, it's 9-11. Okay, so. I am so sorry. It says 21 after. I need to fix my clock. Oh, then we have time for all of the I always said my... I set my mechanical clocks routinely 15 minutes ahead to get me out the oh door on time. That's only my digital devices that give me real time. All right. So <laughs> that's a good thing, though, because we have a lot of good ones. Um, let's see. For everyone, but especially Terrence Taylor, what work do you think needs to go into the stories we are creating for children when almost every cartoon uh. still has them doing imaginary play and Piff Helmet being adventurers? So Terrence, that one was <laughs> for you. <laughs> oh, Dora the Explorer, how we love you. Even if you are of color, you're you're living in a strange little world. It's also like, I remember there are so many shows like that, that um, uh, Magic School Bus, which went inside the body as well as other places, but um, uh, Carmen Sandiego, where in the world is Carmen Sandiego? Um, it's, I, were, I came up in children's television in the 70s in a period with a, a group of really wonderful special people who were doing things about, specifically the first show was about multiculturalism. It was called Vegetable Soup, and the only thing the show was about was giving kids, introducing kids to different cultures, how they cooked, how they lived, traditions, little dramas, and it was 30, 40 years ahead of its time, and we're finally getting back there. And I think, I go back to the old, uh, uh, parable about beating the good or bad dog i think when you're dealing with writing for children you have a choice of which dog you're feeding if you give children nutritious content that teaches them how to deal with life in reasonable ways that are viable as opposed to in a very restricted way you raise a good child and that's that to me is the base. i really put that to everything which dog am i feeding right now am i feeding the one that's going to bite me in the leg in an hour or the one that's going to curl up next to me and nurture me and when you're dealing with children, that's the first question to have to ask. What am I giving them? Are you giving them a bag of glass to play with? Or am I giving them something that's going to let them walk away with something more than they came in with? It's very, very wise right there. Um, and yeah, does anyone else have, have an answer? Because uh, if not, we can move on. But. I have a four-year-old and some of the things he watches aren't that anymore. And it is nice. Uh, mm -hmm. um, what's the name of that? Darn it. There's too many shows, you know. He, he's watching things that absolutely reinforce this uh, superheroes, you know, because I can't stop it. I would like to stop it. Yeah. Um, I can't think of the one show that is a great example of the opposite of this. I do, th I do think children's writers <laughs> are trying. Uh, sorry, this is a terrible answer. Someone else. Some of them are very trying. Believe me, I've met a lot of them, but they're not trying hard enough. They're just being trying. Yeah, and I, I wish I could say more, but I just um, finished writing three episodes for a show that I can't talk about because of NDA that will come out in an undisclosed time of the future. Um, and I, I do like this is this is targeted for children. Uh, of course, the main characters aren't human, so I won't get into more detail than that. But there was at least an attempt in, in the, the writers meeting to try to make this show as anti that as possible. So like, it's, it's got none of that explorer, although there is a lot of these characters discovering things about themselves because it's a children's show and that's something that kids do a lot. And it's about two different worlds and characters from both worlds are, are learning about each other and meeting each other. Um, so that show in particular, I'm hopeful for. Uh, children's television in general, I, I can't speak to uh, because I don't watch widely enough. Um, but yeah, I, I wish I could say more. <laughs> You know, I, I wonder, and my kids are grown and uh, the next generation hasn't come, like my sister just had a baby. So I, you know, I haven't been working with children much, but I wonder about the timelessness of things like looking at the past, archeology, span anthropology, in fact, you know, paleontology. I, a couple of my mother's uncles were, uh, my cousins were 
One was an archaeologist and one was a paleontologist. And that was always just something fascinating to look at the past or to look into the into the earth to see what was in the past. And you know, I, I wonder how that can be done and uh, in ways that don't say, oh, they're dead. You know, it, it's not, but what were they? You know, what, you know, and how are our lives different than theirs? And not just in the good, in the sense of, oh, see, we're alive and we've got iPhones. <laughs> uh, but, you know, to, to well, look and understand that, that the, because there is, is this appeal of the ancient, the ancient world. All right, we just got a 10 minute warning. That's plenty of time. All right. Uh, the, oh, uh, that's a, for Michael. Uh, well, note the Dream Quest of the Unknown, the title of the Lovecraft novel. All right, next question. Um, can the oh, panel. What was that title? Oh, yes, the Dream Quest of the Unknown. K oh, yes, of course. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so the next question uh, Can the panel discuss the impact of the author's background on the story's use of? white savior etc tropes etc i should just say etc in modern terms an author that is not quote uh, unquote woke may write a certain way a white male white may write a certain way etc so as the community of authors gets more diverse my premise is sci-fi destined to get away from these tropes um analogous question pertains to the diversity of the readership so i guess that question is asking on how the perspective of the writer um, might affect the, these tropes and as more perspectives are getting into the field how might the the field change i think that's oh, what's wow. happening now I mean, and it's causing yeah. all this conflict and it's causing us to have this panel uh that there's going to be all this progress uh culture wars i hate this expression but you know uh it's it's easy to say that yes um the more we see what we've been doing the more the demographics of the United States, even out in there's fewer white people compared to all the other people who aren't white, this will get better. But there's this huge and painful process of people letting go, uh, adapting the, the people who uh, are writing in this tradition that white colonizers have established, uh, getting past what the white colonizers told them was a good story. Um, before you all were on here, Darcy was telling us that she was writing something with a Leapon Apache story structure, and my eyes yes. are like, <gasps> can you move? Uh, and uh, and I want to put you on the spot, but you know, oh things yeah, like that. And I, I have to say, so I was referring to my my second book is called A Snake Falls to Earth, um, and it's it's a fantasy book, and in a lots of way, like there's a lot of my Lipon culture influences that book, including the stories, but with A Snake Falls to Earth. Because of the reception I got to Alatsaway, readers from all different backgrounds just were so supportive of me. I felt more empowered to just write a the book of my heart um, that just it goes full on out. The story structure is 100% based on these stories that I heard growing up. These these stories told to me orally by my mother, which she learned from you know her great or my great grandmother or my grandmother, uh, and it's. For me, I, I, I do see that I am fortunate to be publishing now because I've spoken to other Native people who wrote in the past and who had difficulty getting these perspectives published in genre fiction um, because they weren't expected to be accessible to a wide audience. And, and you, that's not what I found. I found that overall readers are just very open and um, they want to read about perspectives that might not be theirs. And, you know, indigenous readers have actually found comfort in reading stories that are familiar to them. Uh, so so that doesn't exactly uh, address tropes, but I, I do find that as, as more different voices are getting published, it's getting easier for, for everyone with perhaps a different perspective who wants to put it out there. Um, but yes, that, that's a, a snake falls to earth. And thank you for giving me the, the chance to talk about it. I uh, always love that as a writer. <laughs> uh, as an as a, as a old white male, I think well, also one of the things you need to do is to look at the parts of your culture that are not necessarily pretty typical. You know, I, I have, uh, you know, I may look like a wasp or sound like a wasp, but I had uh, a polar, I, uh, 
German Jewish grandfather. I had uh, shanty Irish uh, ancestors. The real, the real, you know, poor from the uh, potato famine, living in a house that was assessed by at thirty dollars in uh, value in you know, eighteen fifty or so. Um, and you just try to look at the other side of things. There just is, was not uh, the 1950s suburbs where everybody was trying to be just the same. Because there's a lot more history than that. Yeah. I mean, I think that the last 20 years for me has been a thrill because I grew up in an age where we had Octavia Butler and Sam Delaney, and that was it. I mean, there were others, but we didn't know about them. They didn't get talked about. And I think that the biggest issue is that people love stories. And the more stories there are, and the more kinds of stories there are, the better it is for all of us. I don't think that any of the new diverse, in quote unquote, writers who are now getting an opportunity, like you say, that they never had before, are taking anything away from what exists. It's adding to. I was reading Marvel comics, and I remember the whole big kerfuffle about Black Captain America or whatever, and all these different things. And I, I read these comics. I've got the Marvel app. I'm addicted. Nothing went away. Even Tony Stark is alive again. I mean, he was dead. He's alive again. It's no one lost anything. They got additional things. They got Ms. Marvel, who's, who's you know, got a different background than Miss, Miss, Miss Marvel, who's the white one and the blonde. There are all these new characters, Miles Morales, but Peter Parker is still around. It just included us. I read a piece today that Robin, uh, the third Robin, Jason Todd is gay. He comes up in the series. I immediately went running to the iPad to find the series of stories. And they made Iceman gay in his younger incarnation. And the older one couldn't quite figure that out since he didn't remember that. But there, there's just, I feel so included now in the things that I see in movies and read. And sometimes it's heavy handed. Sometimes it's like, I don't think that woman was black in Victorian England. But and that aside, colorblind casting aside, just the feeling that if, had I grown up in high school with the material that's out there now, I would have had a completely different sense of myself. I would have felt included. I felt like a complete outsider. Certainly that helped my writing in a lot of ways, but as a person, I would have liked to have felt like I was part of the world and not a subset of black and gay and Catholic and no one wants to talk to you. So it all just gives us so much more to have. And that's always a good thing. And I, I think that's an absolutely perfect uh, way to close this panel. Um, so I want to thank oh. you all for coming so much. Uh, is there any last minute thing, like projects you'd like to hype? We have one minute. Where can The only thing is read my review column in Nightmare Magazine called Read This. People need to read it. I, I have a good time with it. Look us up later, please. We didn't get a chance to introduce ourselves. I'm so glad this worked eventually. Yes. And uh, the conversation will continue in main track two on Discord. Um, thank you so much, everyone, again. Uh, it was such a pleasure speaking with you. This has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, it's, been, it's been an honor to moderate. Thank you, Darcy. And thank you for doing a beautiful job of it. I love it. I always love it. <laughs> after, after it got up and running. <laughs> yeah. Great. This, is, this has been wonderful. All right. At least they gave us back the time we lost. So yes, we can't that, that's you. much appreciated. And thanks to everyone who was patient in the Discord and, and, and who watched us speak. I appreciate that.